Good morning, friends. <coughs> Welcome to uh, CEC live lectures. And uh, as you know, we are running a series on world literature. And uh, by world literature, we mean something different from <coughs> what was believed to be the case uh, a few decades ago. Uh, you know that in the 20th century, the uh, world became more unified than it ever was. And uh, people then started in literature and culture addressing the world audience. And that, you know, shaped a specific kind of writing uh, that we can call now uh, world literature. So under this series, we have had already a number of lectures uh, covering regions, cultures, countries. And uh, you would have seen that uh, these lectures uh, bring out the specific reality of the place that we discuss. Uh, uh, in, in, in today's uh, lecture, we have the expert, Dr. Pahal Nagpal, uh, who has done uh, extensive research in literary theory uh, and drama. And uh, she'll be speaking on uh, the topic uh, that is called 20th century uh, writing in Iran. And uh, Dr. Bayal Nagpal uh, has taught English literature uh, in Janaki Devi Memorial College, Delhi University. And she has published a large number of books and articles. Uh, <clears throat> the title, as I said, is the 20th century poetry in Iran. And uh, that will tell us about the uh, particular aspects of Iranian creativity. And uh, uh, before I request Dr. Pahar Nagpal to uh, speak on this topic, uh, let me tell you that the last 10 minutes of this lecture, uh, which means that uh, starting from uh, 10.50 uh, to be precise, uh, we can uh, you know, discuss things with our audience. So you are requested to uh, approach us. You, you can uh, ask your questions. You can make comments on what is being said. And then, you know, Dr. Pahal Nagpal would be glad to respond to your queries and to your observations. Uh, for this uh, particular discussion that happens at the end of the lecture, uh, we have a toll-free number. Uh, please note it down. It is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, this toll-free number that you can use for asking questions is 1-800-110-430. So now I request Dr. Pahal Nagpal to uh, welcome Dr. Pahal Nagpal. And uh, please give your lecture. Thank you, Professor Prakash. Uh, today's lecture uh, will be on 20th century poetry in Iran. Uh, if we look at uh, a country like Iran, which is extremely rich uh, when it comes to literature and especially poetry, and um, uh, uh, especially in the context of a lot of experiment that happens in the 20th century in Iran. So uh, uh, Persian literature, by and large, is um, always been um, you know a great great um, ocean from which we have uh, you know seeked inspiration and uh, looked at poetry of different kinds different forms uh, but when we sh move from and we shift from the medieval period to the 20th century there are other things that happen and we look at uh, though of course i mean it's like uh, uh, kind of looking at things in a linear manner but by and large uh, poetry uh, up to the 20th century uh, remained, uh, you know, under court patronage, and uh, so in in that sense, the whole idea of courtly poetry that catered, in a sense, to uh, you know the 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 powers that be. So uh, that that was uh, there, and of course, within that, uh, medieval poetry has always been extremely uh, subversive. But the, uh, largely, the context uh, of uh, poetry up to the 20th century remained that of the court. When we move from there uh, to uh, the 20th century. Uh, we look at what is called constitutional poetry and the word constitutional because it is only at the beginning of the 20th century somewhere around 1907 that a sense of uh, you know the constitution that would control the powers of uh, the rulers came into being because uh, before this uh, primarily there was dynastic control so in the in in the early 20th century that is around 1907 onwards when there was a sense of the constitution there was also this uh, you know the the idea of religion for instance uh, you know the primarily uh, the the context in iran is that of shiite islam so that was uh, being reconsidered uh, constitution uh, based understanding of the country uh, the idea of reform uh, the use of language uh, that belonged to the ordinary people became a part of poetry. Uh, 
and of course uh, the political changes that were there in Iran became a subject of poetry. So, which is why uh, you know this this uh, very sharp dividing line that happens in the 20th century because prior to this the framing uh, context has been that of the court. So, uh, if we look at uh, one or two uh, important events before we actually discuss uh, a few poets from Iran, I think we need to uh, have in mind uh, some changes that take place in the political graph of Iran. So, for instance, um, in 1921, we have uh, the beginning of the, uh, the Pehlvi control in a sense because uh, we have Reza Khan Pehlvi who is a military commander who gained control in nine of Iran in 1921. So, from dynastic control to uh, you know Reza Khan Pehlvi and uh, the name Iran in that sense is officially adopted in 1935. And uh, 1941 then, we have, uh, uh, you know, Reza Khan Pehlvi's son, Muhammad Reza Pehlvi, uh, who's, uh, who uh, gains control of Iran. And uh, the Prime Minister at that point of time, who's democratically uh, elected, is uh, Muhammad Muzadek. And uh, eventually, however, Muhammad Muzadek is overthrown and uh, Fazullah Zahedi becomes the minister. So, um, at this point of time, uh, what happens is that uh, state control also kind of, you know, moves into areas of uh, uh, trying to control uh, uh, the, the poets, the democratic writers and uh, in a sense the dissenters and that was a huge subject of poetry and the advent of modernity uh, in Iran. And um, finally, however, in 1979, uh, the Shah's family is exiled and there is a very major cultural uh, revolution that begins in, in, in Iran in 1979 after which uh, of course uh, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, comes in. So what is important for us is this period of the 20th century where uh, you know uh, the, the European influence is evident and uh, uh, a lot of experiments in poetry happen. So for instance uh, free verse is used, the classical forms that were there uh, in uh, poetry up to the 20th century, these forms were uh, you know being replaced by poetic experiments that came in from the west and uh, all this really uh, you know escalated somewhere around the 1950s and we also have you know that ties up in a sense with the uh, early phase of the second Pehlvi era. So, uh, in 1946, for instance, uh, there is the formation of the Iranian Writers Congress. So, in a sense, there is some kind of dialogue that is happening between uh, the state and uh, the writers. So, um, uh, however, uh, you know, uh, once uh, 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 Muzadek is, uh, you know, who was democratically elected and there was some dialogue that was happening with the intellectual lobby there. But in a post coup state, uh, you know, uh, these intellectuals are also under attack. And of course, the most famous example is of uh, Khusro Golsurki, who was executed in 1977. So, uh, but there was a, the general feeling up to the Cultural Revolution, uh, you know, was that uh, uh, the poet is somebody who has to be committed and, uh, you know, is somebody who has to be away from power and closer to the, the khalk or the common people in that sense. And I'm here uh, referring to uh, uh, um, Fatima uh, Shams's uh, understanding of this period. So, um, in uh, 1977, for instance, just uh, when the Cultural Revolution begins, there is something called uh, the Ten Nights of Poetry that happen at uh, uh, the Goethe Institute in Tehran. And uh, for tw 10 consecutive nights, the most renowned uh, of Iran's modernist uh, poets voiced their protest against the monarchy in their poetry. Uh, on the 10th night, the institute was raided by the police and this uh, of course triggered a new wave of protests in which poetry was, uh, poets were also deeply engaged. So this is by Fatima Shams. So uh, we understand that um, it is during this time uh, that you know, uh, experiments in poetry at the level of structure, at the level of thought, at the level of content were happening. So especially if we look at it in terms of the 1940s and uh, the fall of Reza Shah Pelvi, the beginnings of the second Pelvi era, which was a period of great intellectual exchange between Iran and uh, you know the, the West, so to say. And it is uh, seen as the beginning of what is known as the Persian free verse or uh, the Sher -e Azad and uh, the influence of the modernists and uh, uh, especially the French symbolists uh, on Iranian poetry is quite evident here. Uh, uh, you know, before I actually begin with who, a person, a poet who's uh, understood to be the father of modern poetry in Iran, uh, Nima Yushuj, um, uh, we uh, will also look at uh, 
uh, the kind of poetry that uh, prevailed just before that to understand the concept of modernity that emerges in Iran around this time. So for that, I'd refer to uh, Parveen Etasami's uh, uh, poetry. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, she writes, a home without a woman lacks amity and affection when one's heart is cold, the soul is dead. Uh, a little later, she writes, a woman was an angel the moment she showed her face. How ironic then that Satan slanders the angel. So we see that in early 20th century poetry, uh, uh, the uh, focus is on talking about the context of the woman and also explaining it in, in ways in which it is understood by the society. The important fact being that the woman is the subject of poetry. But um, a very, very uh, important uh, factor that's captured by Parveen at the Sami is uh, the importance of education. And this very poem, uh, you know, A Home Without a Woman, so it ends in a very interesting way. Uh, she writes, uh, what are colourful gold brocades and glittering ornaments good for, if the face lacks the beauty of excellence? The hands and neck of a good woman, O Parveen, deserve the jewels of learning, not of colour. So, um, uh, in this early phase, Atasami recognizes and records the importance of education for women and says that, you know, colorful brocades and glittering ornaments, these are not uh, important for the woman. So, uh, and of course, we can also compare something very similar in the context of India because this is the, you know, pretty much the pre independence period where women were also struggling for education and so on. So, um, Parveen Atasami re realizes the importance of education and says that, you know, any kind of jewelry or uh, ornamentation is not important for women. With this, however, we now move into uh, uh, the poetry of uh, Nima Yushij. Uh, you know, who's uh, born in 1895 and lives up to 1959 and uh, uh, is, is the maker of modern poetry in Iran. So, um, and of course, you know, the years of 1940s particularly are very significant in Yushid's uh, poetry. So, um, Yushid writes uh, different kinds of uh, poetry and it's interesting that uh, Yushid was educated in uh, what were known as the elementary schools of the Maktabs and from there, uh, you know, he was uh, then uh, admitted into a ca Catholic school. And so, uh, one can see uh, the impact of uh, the West in a sense in his poetry. So, um, the, the whole idea of uh, modernism at, as it existed in the West and its impact here can be seen in these lines. My house is cloudy, um, the entire earth is cloudy. Above the narrow pass, the shattered and desolate and drunken wind whirls downward. The entire world is desolated by it, so are my senses. So this idea of desolation, this idea of uh, the night particularly, you know, in, in a lot of poets have actually uh, referred to uh, night in their poetry. So, you know, I mean, also looking at uh, desolation here and the use of night in many other poems and of course also by Yushuj. So, for instance, there is a poem called Moonlight and Yushuj writes, Hey people, uh, 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 this, is, this is a poem titled, Hey people, sorry. Hey you over there who are sitting on the shore, happy and laughing. Someone is dying in the water. Someone is constantly struggling on this angry, heavy, dark, familiar sea. When you are drunk with the thought of getting your hands on your enemy, when you think in vain that you've given a hand to a weak person, to produce a better weak person, when you tighten your belts, when, when shall I tell you that someone in the water is sacrificing in vain? So um, we see um, an angst, an anxiety to struggle with the circumstances feelings of desolation, a talk about night is coupled with a kind of strength and this effort to resist a kind of, uh, uh, you know, the onslaught that is there on these writers. So, um, for instance, in another poem that, uh, you know, refers to night, it is a night of deep darkness on a branch of the old fig tree. It is night, a little later he writes, and with night the world seems like a corpse in the grave. So, images that are very, very striking, images that evoke that sense of desolation. But at the end of it all, he poses the question, will the morning light make the frightening face of the storm disappear? Uh, 
because he is looking towards that dawn, he is looking towards that morning. Or for instance in the line, who can say in what state we will be when dawn breaks. So the idea is that he is not committing himself to either side, but is waiting for that dawn to happen. So uh, here I would also uh, request uh, Professor Prakash to um, talk a little bit about uh, the whole modernist idea about, you know, we also have poets like Mukti Bodh, for instance, who made very good use of um, this idea of darkness. Hmm. <coughs> it's a very important question in the sense, you know, that uh, modernism in Iran, as you have pointed out, uh, is coming through the expression of women. So they, in fact, are uh, able to think about their world and uh, they are able to give a strategy uh, to themselves and to the larger part of the country. And that strategy is to understand the situation as it existed at that time. And that situation is not very encouraging. Uh, there, there's a kind of stifling, there's a kind of uh, desolation, as you say. And uh, through poetry, this awareness of the existence of des desolation, that, that, that comes through. So I believe that uh, uh, overall it's a very positive development that people are becoming aware of the problems existing in their time uh, and uh, they have the courage to uh, formulate you know, the, the, the responses so very clearly. So that is the uh, good part of uh, Iranian poetry at that time and who knows, it's a comment on the earlier poetry which you call the court poetry and in the Pahlavi uh, regime you know, when people started going by the law, by the constitution by giving rights to the writers and others to express themselves, then it was perhaps the golden period. Would you, would you call it the golden period also? Yes. This is in fact uh, otherwise also considered to be the golden period of poetry in Iran. Which is not the case with India. In yes. India, we, we, are, we are locked in the struggle against the Britishers yes. in the 1930s and 40s. But these people are enjoying a kind of constitutional right to express themselves. Well, uh, that uh, constitutional right, uh, of course, was uh, there, but also was very fraught. Mm. So, for instance, um, especially after the overthrow of uh, uh, Muzaddeq, it mm. became very difficult for the poets and the writers to actually, uh, you know, be write very freely. Mm. But uh, still, uh, right up to uh, 1977 or so, uh, they, they, it, there is a, a, a kind of flowering of poetry which has not been uh, seen in Iran. That, that flowering occurs because these people then are uh, uh, doing a risky venture. Yes. The, the, the risk is to criticize the system that, that is putting, you know, breaks on them. So in that, you know, poetry thrives. Yes. And because uh, these rights are not coming to them very easily. Easily, There yes. is some effort on the part of the state to negotiate and to contain these writers. Hmm. But at the same time, uh, the writers also kind of uh, resist, uh, you know, uh, that containment. What do you say to one thing, that, this is the question that occurred to me as you were talking, uh, why is it that uh, this kind of modernism and this kind of uh, veiled protest is coming not from the males but from the females generally? What could be the case? Uh, well, in Iran it's actually coming uh, both from the men and the women. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Parveen Etasami uh, is a woman and uh, Nima Yushir, who is uh, the father of modern poetry, is man and uh, you, we also mm -hmm. have poets like uh, uh, Shamlu and uh, Seferi later, who, who are also uh, writing very well. But I must say that the poetry by the women is particularly striking. And in fact, I am uh, going to discuss uh, one or two more women poets here, like uh, Farooq Farooqzad, who's, who really writes poetry that, I mean, I'm especially uh, in the context of, uh, you know, being in uh, India, in the context of the third world uh, scenario, one relates very well to some of the issues that Farooqzad raises in her poetry. Would you call this period a kind of renaissance in, in, in the Iranian culture? Uh, yes, because uh, I mean prior to this, prior to the 20th century, the whole idea of uh, the construction of Iran as such was primarily through the dynastic control. Mm -hmm. So that changes only in the 20th century mm -hmm. and it, it continues up to only about 1977-1980 after which again poetry takes a turn and starts using the whole courtly context and uh, uh, you know in in praise of uh, the new rulers and there's so one on. thing more that has struck me uh, when you are talking about it if you compare with india because you, you are talking about india also india till today is not able to give the kind of freedom to their women even in writing or elsewhere that iran would have given in the 1930s and 40s yes what could be the reason uh, i it's it's really uh, 
absolutely enriching to see that uh, in the 1930s and 40s mm. the women in iran are writing with a lot of conviction and a lot of strength they are women who have also received education they are women who realize the importance which is why i actually picked up parveen atasami also because uh, she's in a sense uh, you know a little before this uh, uh, idea of modernity that sets in in poetry in iran but um, she too even though she talks about women in terms of conventional roles but is absolutely clear cited when she says that you know i mean gold and brocades are going to do nothing mm. and what you really speaking need is education for women so i think with a generation <coughs> of women who think like that that's where uh, i think writers like poets like farooq zad uh, were able to kind of uh, speak their mind mm. but i'm thinking not only of india but also of britain i'm thinking also of america there are the women there in, in the 1930s and 40s, 40s. Uh, you see virginia wolf in 1920 would like to just talk about one room with a view or, or one, one room of one's own in fact you're so right when you say this because we actually have to wait for us among the buba to actually come Arri- up with the whole arrive idea. in the in the, in in the, the late, late 40s late and 40s, 50s 1949 yes. when hmm. the second sex yes, was written yes. so hmm. yes so iranian woman that way has taken a lead over The, the the rest of the world including the west and including the west because they, they, they have come forward that they are they are writing they are they are asserting themselves they have the right to express and they are carrying in their writing what can be called modernity of the genuine kind and and there is such uh, exploration of these ideas such intellectual exploration of these ideas and thoughts and thoughts that never uh, seem like abstractions mm-hmm. because they are totally rooted in the world totally rooted in the society mm-hmm. something that Uh, uh, as you rightly pointed out we don't see in the 1930s and 40s uh, probably i mean maybe somewhere else but not uh, maybe in india and britain and a few other countries you see there is no education for women in india in the west there is education but but uh, the right of liberty has been given to women only in the 1930s mm-hmm. but then there are no writers there yes. here we have writers here we have so in fact uh, I, 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 this is i think one of the credits to uh, the, the course that we are running that if world literature tells us that there there has been flourishing elsewhere than in europe then this is a kind of uh, you know uh, moral boosting uh, situation for us absolutely and next door iran is next door, next door. and uh, and these women have come forward to tell us what is modernism what is stuffiness what is suffocation what is darkness and how the morning you you quoted yes. that line very well that morning light also would not be able to take it away it is that kind of situation absolutely and uh, this is where i think these are poets these are writers who need to be studied uh, you know in the, in a uh, deeper manner mm-hmm. so and in fact the next poet that we are going to uh, soon enough discuss is uh, farooq farooq zad mm-hmm. and uh, she also writes pretty much during the 40s 50s mm-hmm. is uh, when 50s is when she is writing mm-hmm. and uh, famous poems like conquest of the garden call to arms uh, sin or guna as is a given So um, any line do you have in your notes uh, call to arms from yes, there? Yes, yes. Just give us that line. Uh, I will just give one line uh, uh, in this part. So oh, only you, O oh Iranian women, have remained in bonds of wretchedness, misfortune, and cruelty. If you want these bonds broken, grasp the skirt of obstinacy. Of obstinacy. Obstinacy. Oh, good. Very good. Yes. Mm-hmm. This, this is really nice. Yes. Mm-hmm. so maybe you can in one sentence or two conclude so that our, our first uh, thing is over and then yes. we can take so, it up um, later in, in, in a bigger way yes so in the second part i'll discuss uh, farooq farzad in detail mm-hmm. so uh, it's it's important to uh, keep in mind uh, poets like parveen atasami and neema yushuj particularly because neema yushuj introduces uh, this idea of modernity the whole notion of the persian free verse comes with yushuj and uh, you know uh, with poems like it is night hey people moonlight you should is experimenting with uh, nature and is using these ideas uh, to actually or even if it's an idea of desolation if it's an idea of sadness uh, is using that to, to express the mood of the people at that time and uh, that is something that uh, you should has to be uh, credited with so we'll have more on this in the second part <coughs> So uh friends uh, we have come to the f- uh, end of the first part of the discussion in which Dr. Bhar Nagpal has given us a view of our uh, developments in Iran in the 20th century and in fact modernity begins in life in Iran only in the early part of the 20th century and goes on from strength to strength 
till the middle of it and then of course certain crises take over and uh, things uh, uh, go from uh, this to uh, some other development that, that we'll talk about later. And uh, well, th this is something that uh, is an eye opener uh, for us that you know next door uh, our, our neighborhood contained this kind of a literary expression, particularly in the hands of women. So we'll have more uh, information and more quotations from uh, the poetry uh, in Iran in the 20th century. And uh, uh, that will happen in the second part. So uh, the first part is over and uh, please wait for the second part to come. Thank you. <laughs>
So it's uh, it's quite clear that uh, you know this kind of fearlessness that is there in Farooq Zad is expressed in this writing, and uh, the fact that there is uh, a, a kind of um, declaration of you know owning up to the act of knowledge, and uh, the picking the apple is also the idea of knowledge, and uh, Farooq Zad totally takes that on. And uh, there's another poem called "Call to Arms" that I discussed very briefly. Uh, uh, in the previous uh, lecture. So, in this call to arms, uh, she addresses the Iranian women and says, Only you, O Iranian women, have remained in bonds of wretchedness, misfortune, and cruelty. If you want these bonds broken, grasp the skirt of obstinacy. Do not relent because of pleasing promises, never submit to tyranny, become a flood of anger, hate, and pain excise the heavy stone of cruelty. So, um, again, it's a long poem, I'll just read one more stanza. Where is, that, where is that proud mane? Tell him to get up, because a woman is here, rising to battle him. Her words are the truth, in which cause she will never shed tears out of weakness. So, it's a call to arms. It's when we talk about, for instance, we talk about the feminist movement and we talk about the feminist movement only in the context of the West. It is important to actually understand the feminist movement also in terms of, uh, you know, women who are there from Iran. And uh, uh, this, this almost reads like a feminist manifesto. So, uh, you know, because she's directly the very first line, only you, O Iranian women, have remained in bonds of wretchedness. So, she's addressing them and it becomes a kind of feminist manifesto for everybody. And the fact that she is uh, declaring that she is not going to cry but is going to take things head on. So, um, uh, uh, we need to uh, broaden, uh, when we talk about feminism, we need to broaden our idea of feminism to talk about these women and make it an inclusive movement that looks at the variations and the contradictions that arise from different uh, countries, from different contexts. Um, another very important uh, poem by uh, Farooq Zad, which is uh, Sin or Guna. And uh, it's very interesting, just, just uh, the, the, I mean, read two stanzas and it makes the whole idea very clear and how she's, she's, she's taking on this idea of sin. She says, uh, I sinned a sin full of pleasure in an embrace which was warm and fiery. I sinned surrounded by arms that were hot and avenging and iron. A little later, I sinned a, a sin full of pleasure next to a shaking stupefied form. O oh God, who knows what I did in that dark and quiet seclusion. So, she's leaving uh, uh, us to interpret her poem and she's accepting the, the beauty of what she's talking about, what is considered to be sin and the idea of sensuousness, the idea of pleasure for women is something that is a subject of her poetry. Um, so, um, Again, uh, I think any discussion about Farooq Zad would be incomplete without a reference to her poem called The Wedding Band. And um, I think uh, for a poet who's writing in the 50s, let's say, to write a poem like The Wedding Band is way ahead of her times. Uh, when in the West, we are barely talking about what we now call the second wave of feminism. So, uh, The Wedding Band goes like this. The girl smiled and said, what is the secret of this golden ring? The secret of this ring that so tightly embraces my finger. The secret of this band that sparkles and shines so. The man was startled and said, It's the ring of good fortune, the ring of life. Everyone said, Congratulations and best wishes. The girl said, Alas, that I still have doubts about its meaning. Uh, the poem finally ends, uh, the next couple of stanzas are about how time has elapsed and finally then the last stanza goes, The woman grew agitated and cried out, Oh my, this ring that still sparkles and shines is the band of slavery and servitude. So uh, I think this realization and I'm particularly struck by the line where uh, in the very first stanza Farooq Zad writes, The man was startled and said, so, uh, the whole idea is that even expecting a question is something that startles uh, the man in this case. So, uh, I think this kind of uh, clear-sighted feminism and complete understanding of the uh, 
lives of Iranian women. I think this is something that Farooq Zad uh, does beautifully. And this is where, of course, uh, the whole idea of free verse that Nima Yushuj had started uh, the trend of becomes very, very useful. And we have a lot of poetry by Farooq Zad in this stream. Uh, I'd uh, request uh, Professor Prakash to uh, you know, talk about uh, poems like The Wedding Band, for instance. <clears throat> Once again, uh, uh, matrimony comes under attack yes. and comes under attack as an institution. And uh, she is not merely expressing her anger uh, or resistance. She also expresses a very great understanding of the situation. Yes. Th that understanding, that knowledge, that you know, uh, uh, the Islamic thought called uh, Shiaism, that I uh, uh, talks about, that is there in these poems. The whole thing has become uh, a kind of subject for criticism, and that thing belongs to society. So in society, there are institutions, and there is matrimony, and there is there, there is this band, there is this wedding band, and there is this ring. And the ring, you know, is uh, taken very seriously by the writer uh, till the end when yes. the, 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 the opposite conclusion comes. Yes. That this, this is the, uh, you know, a ring is the band of slavery. slavery. So uh, if, if that is called slavery by, by, by women in the middle of the 20th century, then this kind of a thing is not seen, uh, you know, in this form, uh, in this kind of a color elsewhere. Maybe there, there are stray references here and there, but she is taking a the whole situation in its in, in its uh, you know um, in its crux the crux is slavery and in order to be be free from the slavery one has to do away with uh, you know matrimony and this kind of relationship in fact it's interesting because in the west there was this myth the f of you know the married woman who's the happy woman hmm. so it, it took a book like the feminine mystique to actually kind of you know uh, uh, do away with such ideas but uh, i mean farooq zad's clear sightedness here is uh, really, really uh, something to marvel. And very valuably, she is able to combine, you know, uh, th th this kind of critique with the tree of knowledge. Yes. And, and the, it is that tree of knowledge which is sensuous. It is the, there is a crack and through the crack you see the garden, garden. and you have to see the leaves trembling. The whole thing is so very different from the static situation in which people have been kept all across. Kept all across. So, knowledge that way gives a kind of freedom, a, a, a kind of uh, power to people and that knowledge is sensuous. Yes. This is something new. Knowledge is supposed to be very dry, dry as dust in our case. So, in fact, we have a kind of uh, you know distance between feeling on one side and uh, you know uh, thought on the other. But this woman says that it is knowledge, it is thought, you know, that, that makes the world beautiful. And one can see the evolution, in a sense, from poets like Parveen Atasami to Farooq Zad. Mm -hmm. So that the fact that women in Iran have been extremely concerned with the the uh, changes that are taking place in society, with the position of women. So, um, it, it, in this uh, light, we, we can also discuss another poet mm -hmm. uh, called uh, Sohrab uh, Seferi, who is also uh, modernist in his approach and he was also a painter. So, um, uh, he's uh, written poems like The Footsteps of Water, where he writes, Life's a pleasant tradition, life's wing is as vast as death, life's a jump the size of love, life's not something we put on the mantle of habit and forget. So, uh, on the one hand, we have poets like uh, Farooq Zad, who are absolutely uh, rooted there in the context of the society. And then, of course, we have Seferi, who introduces uh, different ideas. For example, when knowledge still nestled by springs, man indulged himself in his azure philosophy in the delicate indolence of a meadow. His thoughts flew with the bird. He breathed with trees. So a kind of freedom that he's aspiring towards. And, uh, you know, with lines like, it does not matter where I am, the sky is always mine. So, um, a very, very important uh, poem by uh, Seferi, uh, from the ones that I'm aware of, uh, is Water. And uh, where he talks about the need to kind of preserve nature, the need to preserve one's sanctity in terms of the world that we live in. So, he says, let's not soil the water, perhaps a pigeon is drinking down there, or a thrush dipping its wing by a far thicket or a pitcher being filled in a village. Uh, again, uh, a couple of stanzas go on in this strain. And he says, um, uh, sweet water, clear stream. People are so affable there, may their streams bubble and their cows produce abundant milk. Never have I visited their village. Their hedges must bear God's footprints. There, moonshine illuminates the expanse of speech. So it's a kind of idyllic world that he's reminding us of, that we need, need not pollute our own world and our own context, uh, you know, uh, but we need to kind of keep that ideal in mind. Uh, then, of course, we have 
uh, you know, uh, poets who also been journalists like Ahmed Shamlu, who was uh, you know a journalist and he also wrote a lot of poetry. He was arrested, imprisoned many times. He's also a translator. Was a chief editor of magazines such as the Mamshad and. Um, uh, a very very important poem that uh, Shamlu wrote is in this dead end and he writes uh, they smell your mouth to find out if you have told someone I love you they smell your heart such a strange time it is my dear and they punish love at thoroughfares by flogging we must hide our love in dark closets in this crooked dead end of a bitter cold they keep their fire alive by burning our songs and poems. Do not place your life in peril by your thoughts. Such a strange time it is, my dear. So one can see pretty much why Shamlu, you know, would have uh, uh, been uh, uh, considered to be a threat because he's going against every possible uh, uh, dictum that is uh, a kind of practice, let's say, in the context of religion, uh, specifically over there. So he says that, you know, uh, behold, butchers are, are on guard at thoroughfares with their blood-stained cleavers and chopping bones. So he says that uh, such a strange time it is, my dear, intoxicated by victory, Satan is enjoying a feast at our morning table. We must hide our God in dark closets. So uh, the fact that uh, when one looks at anything uh, that is uh, sensitive, anything that is sensuous, so people are going to be flogged if one looks at uh, radical uh, songs and poetry so people are going to be flocked for the same and so he says the he who knocks in on your door in the middle of the night his mission is to break your lamp we must hide our lights in dark closets so uh, on the one hand he says we must hide but yet at the same time we can see that Shamlu is certainly not hiding anywhere but when he wrote these poems he declared his intent he declared uh, uh, the factors and the powers that he was certainly resisting and uh, this is what makes uh, uh, poets like Ahmed Shamlu extremely valuable. So on the one hand we have poets like um, Farukzad who talk about the context of women and then we have Shamlu who talk about uh, the context of the society that is there in Iran and Shamlu lives up to, uh, lived up to about 2000. So, uh, uh, you know, but his uh, primary um, uh, work again of the golden period of uh, Iran, which is why the 20th century is considered to be, in terms of poetry, its golden period. And uh, uh, this this brings us, uh, you know, to another very very important poet, uh, you know, uh, Khusro Gulsurki, who was born in 1944, and he was executed in 1974. So he lived for only 30 years, and uh, in these in this very very uh, short span he wrote poetry that is really very very uh, interesting in fact uh, uh, to share this with you uh, Professor Prakash this is one poem that's kind of anecdotal so uh, the whole idea of one plus one is one so the poem goes like this that a teacher writes on the board that one uh, is uh, uh, if you uh, put one plus one it's the same so the student says that this equation seems to be a blunder. Hmm. So it, uh, the fact that uh, it cannot be, he says if one is considered to be a human unit, then it cannot be equal to one. Two human units cannot be the same because uh, there is disparity, there is discrimination and so on. And so the teacher at the end of it says that uh, everybody write in your notebooks that it is not equal. So, uh, this is uh, th this is th this is what poetry should do. Poetry should you know problematize the issues. Uh, poetry should talk about these problems and talk about philosophy and all those things, and then put together and show things in a new light. In fact, uh, I would like you to on, on the tangent you might think of uh, you know uh, defining romanticism as we understand it from English literature, and there is a different kind of romanticism here. Yes. There, the romanticism puts you know feelings against thought. Here, it is thought you know which brings in feelings. And, and, and uh, makes feelings a kind of symbol of freedom. What do you say? I totally agree with this because uh, uh, the thoughts are very, very important mm -hmm. and the thoughts are well constructed. There is no uh, kind of uh, haziness there. They're not trying to hide their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And these thoughts are coupled very well with imagery that emerges from nature, with from things that they see around them. And uh, that is both the beauty and the strength of uh, poetry of this time. So even though 
uh, there is a kind of modernist trend that emerges in this poetry mm. that comes from the West. But uh, this um, uh, trend is still something uh, that they are able to rework in their own way in their context in Iran. Mm. In fact, I would suggest that uh, these poets should be compared not with the uh, West European uh, thought or uh, creativity, but with people like Pablo Neruda. Yes. They are very close to him. He takes pleasure in senses and he, he, he uh, makes you know, a pleasure a kind of uh, door to freedom, which is what Neruda does all, Neruda the, time. Does all the time. And uh, Octavio Paz, he talked about in another lecture, uh, he was also suggesting in his own way that you know, thought is not as negative as, as, as the West has made it out to be. You know, in fact, uh, this particular, uh, if one were equal to one, so this is extremely striking. If I just read out a few lines from this, if one were equal to one, who would die of poverty mm. or who would die of lashing? Mm. If one were equal to one, who would imprison the liberals? The teacher cried. Mm. Please write in your notebooks, one is not equal to one. Mm. So the student raises uh, these questions in uh, the poem that uh, Gulsurki uh, writes. And uh, this is what makes uh, the, the, the whole context extremely, uh, it, 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 it troubles you and makes you ask uh, questions. And who is the student and who is the teacher? Yes. I just, just, it is a student you know, who makes teacher aware of a different kind a of different level kind of society. Of le yes. And society is brought in through this mm -hmm. so, so well. So uh, uh, with this I would like to uh, kind of, uh, uh, before we bring this to a close, just discuss very briefly uh, Khusro Gulsurki who is uh, uh, known for his very, very uh, radical left-leaning ideas and he was, as I, as I mentioned, executed in 1974. He just lived for 30 years but uh, was wrote poetry that, uh, the, the poetry that he has left is uh, really something that makes us think. So, um, he says, If you nestle songs of blood and sword, in you the migrating birds, in you the anthem of victory, your eyes have never been so bright. Out of your blood and the wrath of people, Tukhane Square will ri rise, uh, rise up. People will surge from one side of the square to the other. Bread and hunger will be divided equitably. O standing Cyprus, it is your death that will bring all this. The enemy erects his wall and these passers-by, decent and suffering, these passers-by do not know your name and that is a pity. So. Uh, and he, he continues these ideas in another poem called Anthem of Unity, where he says, we must love one another, we must roar like the Caspian, even if our cries are not heard, we must make them as one. Each heartbeat must be our song, the redness of blood, our banner, our hearts, the banner in the song. With every dawn over the Albers, we must come close together, we must be one, it is our unity they fear. So um, this is the point that I was making earlier, that on the one hand, there was this possibility of the poets, writers who were now discussing these new ideas and uh, there was a kind of a space for negotiation that was happening with the powers at the time. But at the same time, with uh, poets like uh, Gul, uh, Khusro Gul, uh, Gulsurki, it became very, very difficult because Gulsurki, in a sense, uh, became a kind of threat then and uh, so he was uh, kind of uh, done away with. So. Um, he says, once more it is morning and it is the end of the dark night. Once more it is morning and it is deserving awakening. Once more it is morning and we must kindle the fire to burn the enemy. So constantly the reference to enemy, constantly the reference to the fact that people must come together and fight this out is very, very significant. In fact, uh, it is believed that, uh, you know, just a uh, night before they were to be executed. So, uh, uh, you know, they, they, were, they continued to have their discussions and uh, finally, of course, gave themselves their own orders for their execution. So, uh, Gulsurki, and I'll end with this, is that, you know, a person has an artistic eye whose art has a wider link with the people. An artist has a style that forges a link to the life of the people of his land. Uh, he says, why should it fit any literary school? Why imprison our poetry, which is our only effective art form in literary and stylistic schools? The place of a poem, Gulsurki says, is not in libraries, but in tongues and minds. Literature must retain the role it always had in social movements for us to in the displacement of social order and fulfill it. The role of literature is to awaken. So uh, I think uh, with this we can see that Iranian poetry, Iranian literature and Iranian poetry is very, very rich.
and is uh, it has all the elements that in fact uh, one sees in very very disconnected and disparate ways in other countries but here the the sensuousness of nature imagery uh, radical ideas um, a kind of resistance everything is specially captured beautifully in the poetic form could uh, you comment on this particular line the bread and hunger will be divided equally yes. what, what does it exactly say uh, so in uh, this uh, particular poem where he says that bread and hunger this is uh, uh, poem of the unknown mm. uh, so he says uh, uh, bread and hunger will be divided equitably the idea being that everybody will have equal access mm. to everything so everybody will get uh, the same amount of bread which means poverty which means is not the issue poverty is which means the, the, the issue is inequality inequality so he says that if people are hungry they'll be hungry to the same quotient because yes. resources are going to be divided equally mm. That is a very, very good answer to the problem, you know, of, of, of poverty and other things. Because the, if there are calamities, if there, if there, if there is distress in life, let all of us share, share equally. Absolutely. Rather than some people not doing it and other, others are doing it with a vengeance. So uh, all these poets, in fact, these are the major poets actually of Iran and they all realize the sense of inequality and they come forth and state it and also uh, present this whole idea that uh, this inequality needs to be questioned this inequality needs to be resisted. Yes, absolutely. And uh, why imprison poetry? Yes. Well, why, why, you know, uh, put shackles of thought, shackles of preferences to poetry? Let poetry be. Let poetry remain, you know, as, as free as possible. Yes, in fact, he says that the role of literature is to awaken and mm. uh, uh, he, he celebrates this idea. Mm. So the realm of thought uh, and the realm of uh, emotions are the same. In fact, emotions are thought. And, yes. and what is thought is as dry as, as, as to be taken away. Taken away. And uh, knowledge is that way, is, is important. So if, if, we, if we look at it, it is a complete range of poetry that we have from Iran, especially in the mid 20th century, mm. with uh, poets like Farooqza talking about women, uh, uh, Shamlu talking about the problems that writers, poets have to face, and the inequalities that are there in society. And of course, uh, Gulsurki, who's uh, uh, constantly been engaged with uh, this, these ideas for the very short span that he was around. And such a person cannot be left, you know, to, to go scot free. So they, they have to done, do him to death. Yes. And, and, and the person is assassinated. Yes. This, this, this is, well, what does one say about it? And uh, here, you know, poetry and life have merged so very clearly with each other that one can't separate them. Yeah. Uh, so, so poets are citizens, poets are political voices and, and they should be recognized as such. And, and its expression. And its expression, yes. So, uh, friends, uh, <coughs> towards the end, uh, Dr. Pair Nagpal uh, brought in uh, this uh, other poet, Gulsurki, and he was talking about uh, society of his time, its, its problems which were concrete, which were a kind of uh, heavy burden on, on, on the souls and the minds of people. And uh, he was so very uh, clear in his views and uh, so very dangerous for the establishment in his own country. That, that, that they had to finally uh, uh, stuff the voice in him. So uh, uh, towards the end I would say that uh, this kind of a poetry uh, belongs to the uh, now 21st century and people should realize its importance. Poetry is to totally merge with the experiences of human beings as human beings. So, uh, in, in fact, uh, just a point that I would just like to add towards the end that post the cultural revolution in Iran, so once again, the courtly form started being used. So the ideas of change that took place in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. So once uh, people uh, thought that some kind of change had been brought about. So again, the courtly form that was there, uh, you know, oh, from yeah. the medieval period right up to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So that started being used, uh, you know, in praise of uh, the existing powers. So this kind of uh, mediation was again seen as missing. No, the, these dangers will of course uh, keep coming from uh, other quarters, from, from the courtly poetry, from the uh, medieval period, that's a different story. But I think uh, if uh, poetry and if literature are, uh, you know, combined with the idea of freedom, then there is hope for humanity. Yes. And uh, with this positive, uh, you know, lesson that we draw from today's discussion, uh, we come to the close of the lecture. And thank you, Dr. Pahal Nagpal, for giving this kind of uh, information which is so dynamic in its scope. Thank you. Thank you.